In this video, we're going to look at how much energy it takes to heat one kilogram of water from minus 20 degrees Celsius when it's, in, when it's in solid form all the way to 120 degrees Celsius when it's going to be in gaseous form. To do this, it's actually five computations that we're going to have to then add all together. So we can break it into the part where the ice is being heated and that we're going to call region A. The part where the ice is melting and the temperature is not changing, that's going to be region B. The part where the water is changing temperature, the part where the water is changing phase from liquid to gas, and then the part where the steam or gas is being heated. We're going to call those A, B, C, D, and E. So for the first part, we use our equation QA, and A is just standing for the region A, equals MC delta T. So in order to do this, we need to know what the specific heat capacity for the ice is. So we're going to look that up. Here you can see the specific heat capacity is 2,090 joules per kilogram degree C. Okay, and this is in table 14.1 in section 14.2 of your textbook. Now we can fill these in. One kilogram. times 2,090, and that's joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And your book's not real careful with showing the units. The fact that the degree C is actually in the denominator is not clear in table 14.1. The final temperature for region A is 0 degrees Celsius, and the initial temperature is negative 20 degrees Celsius. Delta always means final minus initial, and now we plug these numbers in, and we get 41,800 joules. Now we move on to the second section, which is section region B. And it's a different equation because the temperature is not changing. There's a lot of energy associated with phase changes, but it's not, there's, there's no temperature change during a phase change. So we're going to need to look up the specific heat capacity. I'm sorry, not the latent heat, rather. We need to look at but the latent heat of fusion, and fusion is for the solid-liquid or liquid-solid transition, which is what we're looking at for water. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Here we are in table 14.2 in section 14.3. Latent heat of fusion. We're going to look in the SI unit column here. Well, it's metric, actually. Kilojoules is not SI, but is metric. So we'll come down here to water, 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So it's one kilogram times 334 kilojoules per kilogram. And so that we're working in the same units every time, let's change this from kilojoules per kilogram to joules per kilogram. We know there are 1,000 joules per kilojoule. There we go. So kilojoule. All right, so kilojoules cancel and kilograms cancel. And so then we're left with 334,000 joules. So that's a lot of energy and there was no change in temperature at all during that process. Now we move on to Q sub C. And we have one kilogram still, and then we're going to multiply by the specific heat capacity for water. And that's different than it is for ice, so we need to look up that value as well for liquid water. Okay, back to section 14.2. And we have, let's see, where did it go? Right there, 4186. Again, that's joules per kilogram degree C. The temperature change is from 0 to 100, so 100 minus 0. Q sub C is 4186. So 418,600 joules for this part right here. Okay, now we're going to move on to region D. Here's our regions on there. Okay, so this part where we have the water changing from liquid to gas. 
All right, so during that part, that's a phase change. So we're going to need these, the latent heat of vaporization. And vaporization, that's for the liquid to gas or gas to liquid phase transition. So we're going to need to look up that value. Okay, now we're looking at the latent heat of vaporization for water. It's 2,256 kilojoules per kilogram. And just like before, we're going to take the number in kilojoules per kilogram and convert it to joules per kilogram. Kilojoules cancel, kilograms cancel. And we're left with a value of 2,000 or 2,256,000 joules. That's a huge number. All right, now on to the last part, Q sub E, one kilogram times the specific heat capacity, but this one's not gonna match the specific heat capacity that we had in region C or region A, because this was for ice, this was for liquid water. Now we need the specific heat capacity for steam. So we need to go ahead and look that up. So we go back to section 14.2, Table 14.1, and we look, and steam right here has two values. There's 1520 or 2020. And we're going to use, let's look at the um, footnote here. So the C sub B, that constant volume, and then the value in parentheses is for a specific heat capacity at constant pressure. So we are looking at a constant volume process. So that means the container is fixed. You have a rigid, a strong, rigid container. And as you heat it, the volume is staying the same. The other possibility would have a piston there so that the as you heat it, the piston moves up and it allows for the volume to increase, but the pressure to stay the same. Let's go back up. On that table again. Again, that value was 1,520. Okay, 1,520 joules per kilogram per degree C. Final temperature for region E, 120 degrees. Initial temperature for region E, 100 degrees Celsius. Now we multiply these together. 1,520 times 20, we get 30,400. Okay, so now we're going to total these up, and we're also going to look at what percentage comes from each part. So we can go ahead and fill this in 30,400, and then 2,256,000. Forty-one thousand eight hundred, and we'll look at B or C is four hundred eighteen thousand six hundred. Okay, I went ahead and filled these in. Let's just recap. 41,800 joules for A, 334,000 joules for B, 418,600 joules for C, 2,256,000 joules for D, 30,400 joules for D, and that gives us a total of 3,080,000 100 joules. Now we can calculate the percentage for each of these. So I'm going to take each individual amount of energy for each region and divide it by 3,080,800 joules and then multiply by 100. So I'm going to go ahead and fill those in. What we get is that heating the ice accounted for just about 1% of the total, 1.36. 
Taking the ice and turning it into liquid water took up 10.8% of the total amount of energy. Heating the water from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius took up 13.6% of the total amount of energy. The phase change from liquid to gas, however, took up almost three-fourths of the total amount of energy. And that's astounding, 73.2%. And then the last part, only about 1%, 0.99%. And so this is, I think, pretty startling, that most of the energy, almost three-fourths of it, goes into just that one phase change. The other phase change is, is pretty remarkable too, but not nearly as big as the water, I'm sorry, the liquid water to gaseous water phase change. And that's due in part to the hydrogen bonding for those of you that have studied such things in your chemistry courses or elsewhere.